Ambassador Wilson is a man of great distinction. He served in the House of, uh, of Commons um, for, for several years. He's been a successful businessman and banker. Uh, he served as Minister of Trade, Finance. He was in the Mulroney government as Finance Minister, as I recall. Um, Mr. Mulroney's uh, uh, ambassador at that time was very helpful to us, uh, Mr. Ambassador, because we, uh, at that time, AT&T was about to leave Canada for lack of they, they, weren't be able, they weren't able to compete with the Canadian telephone company, and, and I got the ambassador to come down, and we explained the situation to the uh, AT&T rep AT representative, explained it to, to him, and he said, don't leave Canada, and as far as I know, they, they're still there. So it was a great, great con contribution. So I wonder if, um, if the ambassador could, uh, could come to the podium, and uh, we're going to go off script a little bit and uh, engage in an informal conversation, which I hope is not too mischievous to the staff who's expecting uh, perhaps a formal speech. Uh, the ambassador is obviously a troublemaker, uh, uh, as am I. Uh, first of all, I'd like in all seriousness, however, to, to thank uh, you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for the service uh, that uh, your country is rendering in Afghanistan. As you know, there are uh, 25, 2,600 troops serving in that country uh, with the UN forces. Uh, they've sustained more, to, more than 40 casualties, uh, and one diplomat has been, been, been killed in service there. And this is, a, a, this is a, a, a team of people that are in the most difficult part of the country, so it's a very risky operation, and they're performing with great heroism on a regular, on a daily basis. And the, the government has extended that tour to 2009, so this is not this is not something that's going to be of a temporary nature. This, however, is old business for, for Canada. Uh, as you know, we've, we've had uh, Canada as an ally of the United States in World War I, World War II, the Korean, Korean War, Kosovo, and they've done endless numbers of overseas assignments uh, in very hazardous places for the United Nations. So they've been a marvelous international citizen. And so service in Afghanistan, Afghanistan for the Canadians beside U.S. forces is, is not strange at, at all. Uh, I'd, I'd like, if, if I might, to, to just review a few economic facts uh, for us. I thought the audience might, might be interested. You know, Canada is the second largest country in the world in terms of geography. In terms of uh, exports from the United States, 39 um, of our 50 states uh, have, have Canada as their largest uh, export uh, location. It's, it's quite a significant thing. Here in Georgia, the number, which is not new, is, is in the billions of dollars. I think we've created, we've created something like 200,000 plus jobs in, in, in this state. And at one time, if, if, the United, if Georgia was an individual country, uh, it would be Canada's 13th major trading partner. So it's been a long time a relationship that we've, we've, we've had with Canada. As a matter of fact, our trade with Canada <clears throat> The United States' trade with Canada is greater than the trade with the 25 countries of the, of the e European Union, which has a population base 15 times larger than Canada. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, would you like to say something uh, in rebuttal to those uh, startling statistics? <laughs> well, Peter, uh, first uh, let me thank you for uh, being, uh, I'm going to call you Lou Dobbs this afternoon. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the Mexican Consul General is here, so I dare not go that way. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to participate in this uh, little interview that uh, Peter is going to engage in over the course of the next uh, few minutes, uh, but also to be here at the Southern Center and have an opportunity to speak to uh, this distinguished audience. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, a few things there which I'm going to comment on. One is Afghanistan. Uh, we are there, we've been there since uh, 2002, and we're there for a very clear reason. Uh, we all know that around this time of 9-11, there is uh, uh, a great uh, haven uh, for terrorism in Afghanistan. Uh, we feel strongly about terrorism. We're uh, very much in the, uh, uh, the leading edge of the fight against terrorism, and uh, our participation in Afghanistan is a very important part of that. We view the activities in Afghanistan not just simply to uh, defeat the, the Taliban, but also to assist in the development of the country, building uh, 
the supports uh, to civil society, to a country that's uh, for many years uh, with uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, existence of the, the Soviets uh, in uh, Afghanistan, then followed up uh, with the, uh, the Taliban. Uh, this has been a, a very, very difficult experience for that country, and uh, we are there with uh, a, an alliance of, uh, I think it's 34, 35 countries. So it's a, it's a very important international effort, and uh, we feel very strongly about this. Uh, there is good support for this in the country. Uh, concerns, I have to say, the, about uh, when we have uh, people being killed there, uh, concerns about uh, whether there is sufficient progress towards the development of that civil society, uh, but we feel that this is a place where Canada should be, and uh, as you pointed out, the government has, uh, through a, a vote in Parliament, has extended uh, our, um, uh, our time in Afghanistan at least till uh, 2009. These uh, uh, trade statistics are uh, very important. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the broader picture of Canada-U.S. trade relations, uh, it's $1.6 billion of trade, two-way trade, every day, which uh, amounts uh, in, uh, in the $500 billion uh, amounts uh, for a year. Uh, and this really took off after the free trade agreement of uh, 19. Well, 1987, we shook hands. 1989, it went in, into force. But uh, this has been – it's transformed the economic relationship between the two countries because as a result of that, as a result of the assurance that private sector people had of seeing uh, goods and services to be able to move both ways, uh, a good deal of investment was made based on that, and that has led to the integration uh, between the uh, economies of the two countries. And uh, this has uh, been a, a central part of the, the economic performance of Canada in recent years. And we have seen exports as a percent of uh, our national income go from about 25, 26, 27 percent in the period leading up to the agreement to uh, currently uh, in the 40 percent range. Uh, so that is a huge, huge change and uh, uh, one of the uh, outcomes of this is the degree of investment that has taken place both ways. Uh, the U.S. has about $225 billion worth of investment in Canada, stock of investment. Uh, coming south, it's $190 billion. And I would, uh, I would say that uh, that uh, cross-investment is uh, just a, a remarkable size relative to the size of certainly the Canadian economy. Uh, when you look at it going either way. Let me stop there. I don't know whether I commented on all the uh, statistics. Well, you I was going to talk about investments. I was hoping that you wouldn't say anything about investments. Sorry, Lou. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to talk about energy now. Uh, uh, Canada, as you may know, supplies uh, – is our largest supplier of oil. Um, it also supplies about 18 percent of our uh, – of gas. Natural gas. Natural gas. And Quebec alone provides almost all of the electricity uh, to New England, which is of some significance. So that gets us into the, uh, the oil sands and what's going on in, in that area. Two, two issues there, since most of it's in the, in the west in Alberta. And I understand that's a provincial issue uh, as far as the control of those resources. Um, two, two things. One, what about the environment? Because there are significant costs. Uh, in terms of extraction of those oil properties. And then the second thing of uh, the second issue would be what about the role of the Chinese? We're hearing about the Chinese uh, uh, in Canada exploring the possibilities of buying not only the means of production but also investing in pipelines. Uh, <coughs> just to uh, add a, a comment on the, the, the uh, energy relationship. Uh, it is about 20 percent, as we put it this way, 20 percent of our exports to the United States don't uh, cross a bridge or run down a rail track or cross a highway. They come by pipe or by wire. And the significance of this is there 
don't hold me to these numbers, but something like 20, 21, 22 pipelines, 30-plus uh, uh, natural gas, uh, that was oil pipelines, 31 natural gas pipelines, and I think it's 50 interconnects uh, by, um, uh, of electric power. So, again, huge integration uh, between the two countries uh, in the energy field. Uh, we are in, uh, whether it's oil, natural gas, electricity, or uh, uh, uranium, we are your number one foreign supplier. And the significance of that, uh, uh, just to make the point, is that having that uh, on the same continent uh, with your next door neighbor, uh, a, um, a, a, a country that uh, you have been uh, good friends and allies with for uh, many, many years, is a significant factor uh, when you consider the concern that people have about the uh, source of uh, the uh, of energy security, security of supply. Uh, getting back to the the question, uh, the environment. Put it into context. Uh, uh, the early 80s, the oil sands were kind of a gleam in the eye. There were a couple of companies working away trying to. Uh, make a uh, commercial product of a bunch of goo in the ground. And it was uh, a very, very difficult process. A lot of work uh, has been done on the research on this over the past number of years. A, a, a public-private par partnership, so to speak, uh, between the Alberta government, uh, which owns the resource, and the, um, and the private sector. And it's resulted now in a product that uh, has an 18... $20 cash cost break even or a fully loaded uh, cost of um, the, the upper 20s. So it's now a very viable industry. We have a million barrels a day growing to 3 million barrels a day on projects that have been identified. Uh, but uh, put it into context, we have uh, reserves of about 4 billion barrels of conventional uh, oil and natural gas. Um, and uh, about, about 180 billion oil uh, barrels of, uh, of oil sands oil. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't think there'd be anybody in this room who will be able to outlive the, uh, uh, that source of supply. It's there for a long, long time. Um, this, though, has grown very, very quickly. They planned on about a 4 or 5% growth rate uh, for the development uh, of uh, the projects that are uh, that have been done in the last few years, in fact, because of the demand for oil, the price of oil, it's grown at close to 10 percent. This has put huge pressures on communities with uh, uh, health care, education, uh, social problems, uh, substance abuse. Uh, it has. Uh, it's been very hard in housing because people, sometimes they come from other parts of Canada thinking this is a great place to work, but they don't have a place to live when they get there because the demand has just outstripped the supply. Uh, and then on the environmental side, there's uh, heavy use of water and natural gas in the production of, uh, uh, of uh, oil from uh, oil sands. And there's some very, very good technology. And I think the technology is really the answer to your question, Peter, uh, to get the right technology uh, to reduce the amount of uh, water needed, to reduce the amount of uh, energy needed to produce this. And uh, some of the, the uh, private sector companies who are involved up there, and there are about uh, four or five majors uh, have been there, they're uh, coming up with some very interesting uh, uh, results to address those two problems, but they are very, very key problems. Uh, the final point is on the Chinese. Um, uh, there, as far as I know, there has uh, been one investment by the Chinese in uh, an oil sands project. Not one of the major projects, but it, uh, uh, if I could put it this way, it was kind of a it looks to me that is a kind of a getting your feet wet investment. Learn more about uh, what the oil sands uh, means, the source of or the uh, means of production, and so on. Uh, there's interest in that oil in China. Um, what I'd have to say, and I don't get me to be precise on this because I, I don't have the figures off the top of my mind, but uh, a barrel of oil 
coming from uh, northeast Alberta, uh, by the time it gets to uh, China, is uh, not at this point a very viable uh, commercial uh, enterprise. So uh, commercially, uh, it's far more likely that that oil is going to find its way down uh, to um, uh, either other parts of Canada or into uh, uh, into the United States, uh, particularly as a result of uh, a couple of two or three major investments recently by American oil companies in partnership with uh, Canadian companies. The Canadian companies buying into the refining, the American companies buying into the uh, the upstream resource. Yeah. Statistically, uh, the oil reserves of uh, of Canada. Uh, put them second only to Saudi Arabia, so it's a huge, it's a huge uh, reserve. Uh, given the integration of uh, of Canada, the United States, and our our colleagues in Mexico through NAFTA, uh, and the rise of these very competitive uh, new economies of uh, Brazil, China, India, uh, are there any plans underfoot uh, as far as the government is concerned to to try to create architecture, or is there architecture that exists to to make us or keep us? Uh, uh, competitive in the world? Well, there is, um, Peter. There's, uh, in 2005, the, the leaders of the three countries, political leaders of the three countries, got together and um, initiated what is called the uh, Security on Prosperity in Initiative. It's recognized that the relationships uh, among those three countries uh, were very important and there were security elements uh, about those relationships and uh, economic, financial uh, investment elements that were also very important. So the uh, Security and Prosperity uh, Partnership is designed to uh, bring the countries closer together in an economic sense, not in a political sense, but in an economic sense to try to address the security and the uh, prosperity or the economic uh, uh, aspects of the relationship, find ways that we could facilitate uh, the movement of goods and services uh, between the countries, but do it in a balanced way so that the security uh, drivers would be, uh, would find a balance between the economic drivers uh, in a way that would allow for an easy flow uh, of legitimate uh, goods and services uh, but also respecting the security needs that uh, each of our countries uh, uh, feels they must have in uh, the world that we live in today. I'd, I'd ask you to just uh, consider this in a somewhat broader way as well. Uh, there is a concern in your country, in uh, our country, of uh, the decline in the importance of uh, relative importance of the manufacturing sector. We're seeing parts of manufacturing going to moving to other countries. Obviously, China is a, a, a great uh, uh, end spot for that, but uh, it goes to uh, a, a number of other countries, uh, one of those being Mexico. Uh, this is happening not because uh, Mexico is there, but it's being happening because it's part of uh, the, uh, the global world that we live in and the fact that uh, uh, goods are moving back and forth uh, pretty freely as a result of a series of trade agreements over the last uh, uh, 60 years. Uh, but what I think was the driving uh, thought behind this uh, decision back in 2005 is uh, if we're going to see uh, some of this production moving to other countries, where would we like it to go, to a China or to a Mexico? And if it goes to a Mexico, isn't this the best place, the best uh, destination? Because if we can strengthen the economy of Mexico, then that means that Mexicans are going to be able to buy more goods and services from other parts of uh, North America, the United States and Canada. And that is the, that's the driver. Uh, it will make for a, a healthier relationship between uh, Mexico and uh, the United States and Canada, a more productive relationship, and uh, therefore one that has uh, much more sustainability and stability uh, as we look forward. Uh, so there have been uh, a, a series of meetings uh, last 
uh, April in Cancun, the three leaders got together, reaffirmed this under the uh, leadership um, uh, with uh, Canada attending uh, for the first time under the, uh, the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And there will be another meeting, I would expect, sometime later this year. No date's been set at this point. Uh, where um, President Calderon will be uh, there representing his country for the first time. Uh, but uh, as, uh, as this progresses, uh, I think there's been good, solid support uh, from uh, uh, various elements of uh, uh, people who are involved. And I think you're going to ask another question. Well, I've got a couple of other questions. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want me to answer the question before you ask it? <laughs> I, I gave the ambassador a sneak preview, and you see, that's the kind of thanks I get for. Uh, but I've got one here in my pocket, which uh -oh. I didn't talk to you about. Give me my notes. <laughs> no. uh, I could say a funny story now, but I won't do it. Um, the, let, let's go further north, because what's happened uh, in, in Canada is quite, quite extraordinary. For one thing, uh, I found in doing my homework for this program that uh, Canada and Australia have 43 percent of the uranium resources uh, in the world and 52 percent of the refining capacity. So that means a great deal if you're talking about a, an energy short world in the, in the future on one hand and on the other hand you're worrying about arms control and nuclear proliferation. So Canada is, you see, shaping up as something much more in the future than I think it's ever been in the past. Uh, I was also interested to find that uh, Canada is now the third largest producer of diamonds in the world. And as a matter of fact, our friends from Tiffany have 44 of their specialists up there at Yellowknife, of all places, in a laboratory cutting uh, diamonds. Who would have thought of that? Uh, rather significant. And finally, one thought occurred to me. You know, water is – people go to war over basic commodities. And in India and China, the two countries that we're so concerned about, there are critical water shortages, not only because of drought, because of misuse of the, of the, uh, the, uh, the um, resource. Uh, there, was a con there was a consul general of Canada here one time, and I remember he hearing a speech that he made about Canada being the largest concentration of fresh water in the world. Sometime in the future, we may need you guys to, uh, to, uh, to, you know, to take a bath. <laughs> Peter, you missed your cue. I was setting you up for a question that flowed from my comments on the SPP, and that is that the private sector in the three countries has been involved in something called the uh, national – God, I've forgotten whether – anyway, it's, uh, it's a group of private sector leaders, NACC, and uh, they – are providing its advice. It's a National Advisory Council, competitive, National Advisory Competitiveness Council. That's it, because the whole the, the whole approach here is to improve the competitiveness of. Um, I knew you'd forget the, the name. You see, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, the uh, to improve the competitiveness of uh, uh, the econ the three economies relative to the competitive pressures out there from the rest of the world. Uh, so the private sectors have uh, been asked, leaders in the private sector, I know uh, Home Depot and Lockheed Martin uh, do companies of interest to uh, this room, are involved, but uh, there's also uh, a number of country companies uh, who are providing guidance in a, in a subcommittee type of format uh, to the, the advisory council at the um, – at the, at the top level. And these uh, private sector groups are providing recommendations. Uh, there's a series of recommendations that will have been agreed upon uh, by the, uh, the competitiveness councils, uh, the representatives from the three countries. That will go forward to uh, industry and commerce ministers and then from there uh, f uh, to the leaders for the, the leaders to uh, uh, make decisions uh, based on these private sector recommendations. So it's um, a very uh, a, a very broad effort uh, that is engaging quite a number of people uh, in the community. Um, now, you wanted me to talk about diamonds, uranium. Uh, let me t let me start start with uranium. Um, 
Yes, uh, the, the numbers that uh, Peter has uh, given you are, are correct, but uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent on that because we are very are much... Are going to be embarrassed? No. <laughs> very much engaged um, in the production of uranium. Uh, we have also taken quite an interest in non-proliferation. And uh, just to give you an example of, uh, of one uh, uh, initiative which uh, flowed from the, uh, the G8, one of the G8 meetings uh, three or four years ago, which is uh, uh, where, where we are working closely with uh, the United States and uh, other countries in identifying the location of uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, including uh, uh, uranium or uh, uh, nuclear fuel, uh, uh, in the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union, and uh, destroying this uh, or uh, uh, removing it from uh, circulation so that it cannot be used by terrorist states or uh, people who are supported by terrorist states uh, who uh, can do damage to other parts of the world. So uh, it's a very, very real effort that is making a significant impact on disarmament. Uh, there are other nonproliferation uh, initiatives that uh, we are engaged with uh, and with other countries, uh, but uh, it's that uh, the the uh, in, in involvement that we have with uranium has been a, a significant uh, feature of our uh, ongoing interest in this. Uh, the, the diamond industry is quite an interesting one. It just kind of bubbled up. Uh, people found these diamonds way in the north of Canada, above the 60th uh, parallel, uh, so you're getting within the Arctic Circle. And yes, we have a diamond industry in Canada. Uh, last year, it generated uh, about half a billion dollars of, um, uh, of, of revenues. Uh, we have uh, uh, about 400 people. Uh, no, just under 1,500. 15, 1,500 people. Uh, and that doesn't count the uh, 44 Tiffany people. Uh, 1,500 workers, uh, a number of those workers, particularly at the mine site, are uh, drawn from our Inuit community, so it's providing a very solid way of life for uh, a number of uh, our indigenous peoples, which is important because there are not too many alternative ways of life uh, in that part of the world because of the, uh, the desolate... Uh, um, uh, landscape that uh, they're living in, and uh, obviously the cold temperatures. So this is this is important. Uh, continuing uh, exploration uh, uh, goes on, and we expect that this is going to be an industry which will expand from where we are today. Uh, so um, I can say to both the ladies and the gentlemen in this room, there will be diamonds that you probably buy or receive. Uh, that will be Canadian in source, and uh, they are uh, not engaged in any civil wars or anything like they're up in Canada. Your Excellency, it's uh, guilt-free diamonds. That's the marketing term you're going to have to be using. I, I didn't want to. Uh... If, you, if you're going to represent your country here, I think you should have the right nomenclature here. I, I hate to be critical, but, you know, after, after all. Okay. Um, I wonder if you could talk, since we're in the Arctic, if we could talk a little bit about uh, the implications of the meltdown that's taking place, uh, the ice caps, and, and what that means in terms of maritime trade and, and uh, trade routes in the future. Uh, there's obviously a little uncertainty about where this uh, goes as far as the uh, uh, whether a northwest passage will in fact be open or when it will in fact be open. Uh, but there's no question that uh, there has been a reduction in the ice cap and uh, that is uh, uh, potentially leading to what we might have at some stage uh, a uh, a passageway there that could be open uh, 12 months of the year. Uh, that has significant implications for some of the northern communities uh, in um, uh, Baffin Island up in the, the uh, north coast of Canada 
uh, other of the islands up there where we have settlements. Uh, so it's um, – uh, and it will have uh, uh, some significant impacts in the time uh, for – uh, passage uh, uh, around North America uh, relative to the, the Panama. Uh, so we could see something quite significant developing, but again, that depends on uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a subject that we are all hearing an awful lot about these last, uh, particularly these last few weeks, and that's global warming and where this might take us uh, uh, as we uh, move forward over the next number of years. Now, my experience with uh, with Canada, my, the impression I've had is that uh, they've tend not they've tended not to be quite as uh, entrepreneurial there as their 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 potential might might uh, uh, justify. But lately, we've been hearing about uh, the three P project. Uh, to me, that seemed like an indica free, a, sort of a preview of coming attractions as to the role of the private sector in. Uh, in the communities and uh, townships and provinces of Canada. I wonder if you could tell the audience a little bit about that. Well, uh, three P's, P3's, PPP's, public-private partnerships. Uh, uh, we've been working on these for uh, a number of years. I have to say that uh, uh, other countries have been further ahead of us. Uh, the United Kingdom being a, a particularly so. There's some evidence uh, some of this has been done in, uh, in France. Australia, though, is um, uh, also particularly prominent. Uh, we have uh, had an organization that I've been involved with called the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships, and we've been drawing on the experience of other countries uh, to try to push our governments to do more of these. And uh, I, I should stress here that it's not just shifting a project from one balance sheet to another, but it is also transferring the risk from the public sector to the private sector. It's uh, transferring uh, the, the source of skills from the public sector to the private sector. Uh, I think you can get uh, some wonderful examples in the UK and uh, in Australia. Certainly we have them in Canada, and you're developing these now uh, in the United States uh, where uh, the, the innovation, the skills, the, the design, the change in design from what a, uh, a public sector organization will do uh, relative to what a private sector organization that is – uh, specializes in the design of this or that particular project uh, can be quite remarkable in changing the economics. Uh, the, there's a hidden uh, cost in a project that is produced uh, or that is developed solely in the, private, in the public sector, and that is cost, called cost overruns. People say, well, if we can finance this through public sector borrowing, we're going to save a lot of money relative to the cost of private sector borrowing. And then I, I say, yes, the headline cost may be less, although that's starting to narrow, in particular in the United Kingdom. There's some very clear uh, evidence that uh, that is narrowing uh, quite closely. But the hidden thing that people don't, uh, don't think of is that uh, if there is a uh, – a cost overrun, either in the capital cost or in the maintenance cost, that can have a significant impact in the overall borrowing cost that governments today will, will not uh, point out, but it's happening. Uh, and it's a, it's a very real – if there's a, a cost overrun, I, I, I think I am correct on this number. If there's a cost overrun of 10 percent, that equates to about a 65 basis points increased cost in the overall project, and the same in, in operating costs. Um, so these are elements that uh, you should be very careful of when you consider the, uh, the option one or the other. There's another point, and I can say this as a uh, Minister of Finance, one of the easiest costs for governments 
uh, to cut corners on is maintenance. And what has brought the these uh, private sector, uh, these public-private partnerships uh, more to the fore is that the private sector partner by contract is required to maintain the project and deliver it at the end of the period in a certain state of repair. So um, you all vote, you all uh, look to your, uh, your public se sector to uh, uh, maintain the, the cost uh, or the, the, uh, the state of condition of the assets that the government owns on your behalf, but you don't know whether they're putting enough money into maintenance. And you'll never know until the things start to break down, and that will probably be five or ten years after the government has left that pushed that maintenance uh, uh, off, the, uh, off the current uh, spending. So uh, by contract, the private sector is required to. You don't have a contract with the government to make sure that they do it. That's a, uh, a hidden benefit that uh, you also can't, uh, can't deny. You're going to see more of this in the United States. Uh, you're going to see it, uh, you're seeing it right now, Indiana, Texas have got some major highway projects. But I always, um, when I was making speeches on behalf of this Canadian Council uh, that I referred to earlier, I used to put a map up beside me, and it was a map of the British Isles, and it had a whole pile of icons on there as to the different public-private partnerships that, uh, I think there were about, at that time, a couple of hundred uh, little icons around the British Isles. And it wasn't just highways, it wasn't just bridges, it wasn't uh, uh, um, schools or whatever, but it was uh, prisons, it was uh, defense facilities, it was... Uh, uh, just any number of project that uh, was uh, under a public sector mandate, but you didn't have to have the asset owned by the public sector. You just had to have it controlled by the public sector. And I can give you an example that will maybe help you relate to this. Um, uh, we have a great uh, hotel company in Canada called uh, Four Seasons Hotel. They've got a wonderful hotel uh, in, uh, in this city. Four Seasons own one of the hotels that bears the name Four Seasons. Every other hotel, and, th and they're trying to sell that. Every other hotel is owned by a pension fund, uh, someone who wants to invest money in long term at uh, a reasonable uh, rate of interest. And uh, I say to governments, why do you tie your money up in owning bricks and mortar? Why don't you put your money more actively where, can, uh, where the, uh, the general public wants to see you investing? In other words, in uh, not in the buildings of education, but in the quality of education. And it's that simple trade-off that I think is, uh, is a key part of, uh, of uh, why, why I see that uh, uh, these public-private partnerships are going to become a very, very significant part of, uh, of our way of life uh, in coming years. And you heard it here first. The... Um and this is becoming an issue in Georgia, by the way. It is, it is starting to be an issue. Uh, uh, one question I have uh, concerns the uh, newfound wealth in, in Canada. Uh, while the GNP figures for the growth of the country is, are very good and solid, 2.8 percent or so, so the, the real growth is in the western provinces where they have the newfound revenues from the oil and, and other natural resources. How is the, uh, the government handling this? Uh, imbalance between the provinces and the federal government and their respective income bases? Very carefully. <laughs> um, you heard me say before that the resource is owned by the province. That's, uh, that goes back to the for formation of the country. So provinces own the resource, whether it's the oil, natural gas, the uranium, the, di the diamonds, whatever. Uh, and uh, that is simply a, uh, a fact of life. Uh, it's, um, it has created some uh, sensitivities, some uh, jealousies in the past. I would say right now that there's, uh, there's a recognition of this and uh, something that um, 
we come to be able to manage. Um, what I would say to you, uh, and there's been some indication uh, from the new Premier of the province of Alberta that, um, uh, and uh, in, the, in the public dialogue, public debate uh, on this matter, that uh, uh, this creates an opportunity for uh, a province like Alberta to create national projects projects that will have national implications, national goods, like a center of excellence for some type of research, uh, to uh, give you one example, that uh, will benefit all Canadians as opposed to simply uh, those who are in the, uh, uh, in the province of Alberta. And I would expect we'll, we'll see more of this, uh, this type of activity. Um, I do want to say, and because I don't think you said it in your uh, opening remarks, uh, we have been uh, uh, fortunate in Canada with the free trade agreement with the United States, subsequently broadening into NAFTA, uh, that the health of our economy has made a significant change in the fiscal position of the country. Uh, I became Minister of Finance in 1984, and uh, when I uh, moved into that seat, I found I had a deficit on my hands of 8.6 percent of GDP recognize that the uh, Maastricht numbers are 3 percent, so quite a high deficit. Uh, we worked away at this uh, through a variety of means. We got it down to 3.1 percent deficit or about that Maastricht uh, objective. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, the free trade agreement clicked in. We also uh, shifted from a sales tax that was on a limited part of the manufacturing base and put in a broad-based uh, consumption tax. That combination uh, brought us into surplus uh, nine years ago, and since then we've had nine straight years of uh, budgetary surplus at the federal level, and uh, I think it's 12 of our 13 of our provincial or territorial governments um, have a, a surplus as well. Uh, final point I'll make is that, again, uh, flowing from the free trade agreement, we have uh, a current account surplus, and we've had that current account surplus uh, for uh, something like 28 or 29 consecutive quarters. Uh, when I was there, we had a 4% deficit, and uh, I despaired about this. I thought, uh, you know, this is structural. We'll probably never see us uh, get it down from that 4% level. But uh, uh, the combination of these policies that uh, were put in place around that time have had a significant impact in the, uh, uh, the, both the economic and the uh, financial or fiscal position of the government. Your Excellency, I have to, with great reluctance, conclude this session, but in behalf of the Consul General and his staff uh, here in Atlanta, the World Trade Club, the Consul Accor, who is so widely represented here, and all of us uh, at the Southern Center, we th thank you very much for, for coming and being with us. It's Good. been a great afternoon. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much, Peter.